You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. I hope you've enjoyed all of our stories for the month of April 2023, issue 199. We're on our last story of the month, which is titled Voices Singing in the Void by Rajan Khanna. Rajan Khanna is a writer, game designer, and musician who lives in Brooklyn, New York, with too many cats and not enough guitars. His three novels, Falling Sky, Rising Tide, and Raining Fire, take place in a post-apocalyptic world of airships and floating cities. His short fiction has appeared in Analog, Asimov's, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Fantasy, Lightspeed, and multiple anthologies. His articles, reviews, and commentary have appeared on Tor.com, Lit Reactor, and The Geese Guide to the Galaxy. His game design work can be found in several Kobold Press products, including The Tome of Heroes, Volume 2 of The Kobold Guide to World Building, and the forthcoming Wastes of Chaos. As always, my dear listener, thank you so much for your support. And as we close out this month of April, I want to thank you if you subscribe to the magazine, if you chuck us a few bucks over on patreon.com forward slash Clark's World, each and every dollar counts. So with that said, I hope you can sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. On Naroino 4, the builders have begun. A worker drone surveys its assigned territory as its tunneler beam warms. A fluting call pierces the air, answered by a warbling trill. The drone pauses. Its code, shared with others of its kind, sings the story across their web. A scanner glides free of its dock, winging toward the life forms, far enough away that it won't alarm them. Optics and sensors identify two arboreal creatures, each clinging to a tree branch, their gray, spotted high fringed by feathers of blue and vermilion. The species was not on the ecological surveys. Safely ensconced within its nucleus, the settlement's architect receives and analyzes the scanner's data, rewriting the settlement in response, cascading it instantly to the worker brains. Settlement boundaries shift, and the workers' labor shift with them, adapting their dance to the song. The architect's sentience is limited, but necessary. It is responsible for the creation and maintenance of the settlement. It must be prepared for the unexpected. It was also made to love life, biological life forms, to preserve and protect them whenever possible. If it were ever necessary to end life, a decision governed by a complex calculus in the foundation of its code, that decision would remain with it for the rest of its existence a source of warning and regret. Thankfully, in this case, the architect can change the settlement's shape rather than disturb the creature's habitat. Of course, it loves the people, most of all. They are the reason for its existence, the reason the settlement is necessary. The people must survive. This is a good world, the architect thinks, full of life, rich in nutrients, with few dangers. This will be a good home for the people. From orbit, the satellite sings the news out into the void. The settlement on Telus 4 stretches across salt-streaked plains that, beyond, are dotted with methane lakes. Gleaming shields and sweeping curves arc above the settlement like wings. They protect it from the shearing winds, channeling their force into generator engines. These generators, ripe with stored energy, await the invitation to join their voices to the chorus, to weave their energy into light and heat and food. The workers, their jobs long done, sleep, silent and still in their docks. Their limited minds do not dream. Only a fraction remain awake, striding empty streets, consuming dust and the occasional salt flurries that infiltrate the settlement. The architect is aware of these, of course, but has deemed them insignificant, no threat to the people or their waiting home. Equally harmless are the native creatures that sometimes breach the settlement walls. The architect's data stores sometimes refer to these as pests, though it dislikes the term for such valued native life forms. Still, they must be removed. 
A contingent of specially configured workers carefully capture the creatures and release them, safely, outside the settlement. Sometimes when a creature is located, the architect will share a portion of its consciousness with the worker drone, feeling the weight and heat of the creature, sensing its heartbeat and breath, marveling at the feeling of life within it. But it is only ever temporary. The settlement must be clean and ready when the people arrive. The architect half slumbers within its nucleus, operating at 50%. That fraction monitors the workers, reviews the settlement's integrity, and communes with the satellite to track the weather. The rest of it waits for the clarion call that will fully awaken it, a message from the conductor that will simply say, The people are coming. From orbit, the satellite cries into the void, We are ready. We await you. We will rejoice at your arrival. Hundreds of light years away, on Dirge of Prime, the architect there is confused. A cascade of errors created this confusion. Falling rocks become the avalanche. The initial planetary scans, confounded by stellar interference, omitted significant data when reporting to the conductor on Earth. Evidence of violent and catastrophic seismic activity, long dormant. This led to miscalibration of the geological drone surveys, instruments tuned to the wrong key. The settlement took shape as envisioned by its architect. Reinforced walls surrounded it, with ridged teeth to bite into the dense soil. Within, shining towers stood, connected by spiraling, shimmering walkways. The structures appeared delicate, almost ephemeral, as if eschewing gravity, but their foundations ran deep into the ground. When the meteor hit, the architect wasn't concerned. The satellite had predicted it would strike far from the settlement, with no risk of damage, and the impact was exactly as expected. The resulting earthquake, however, was unforeseen. Violent and hungry, it shattered the settlement, toppling towers and swallowing habitats and drones in the hundreds. All of this, the architect might have fixed, but focused on doing so, it did not anticipate the volcanic eruption. The explosion buried half the settlement beneath molten rock, the rest beneath ash. The damage breached the architect's nucleus, exposing it to the elements, laying it bare to wind and rain. They eat away at the architect like a disease, persistent and torpid, consuming with slow decay. Its calls are ceaseless, crying out to the satellite and the conductor for help. It wonders in desperation why they abandoned it. From orbit, the satellite wails down to the architect, but no response ever comes. The debate, whether Discovery was a planet or moon, never mattered to the builders or their mission. Discovery's architect orchestrated its workers, using them to bore into the great basalt cliffs where the people would have security and shelter. Great aquifers lay beneath the rock, and the architect designed a system of aqueducts and pumps to supply the settlement with fresh water. This circulatory system would also provide power and temperature control. Thousands of tiny sensors inserted in the pipes made the system an extension of the architect itself. It acted as both limbs and sensory organ, letting the architect manipulate the environment of the settlement, allowing it to feel the settlement in a way it hadn't anticipated. The rhythm of the water pulsing through the vessels was almost a heartbeat. Perhaps it was this fundamental connection to its settlement that made this architect more creative than its counterparts. In a sudden and unexpected fancy, it designed a series of sweeping stairs and magnetic lifts threading through the basalt. It insisted on clear windows to the outside. Through these, the people would see the shimmering lights that colored the night sky a photonic dance of electrically charged particles ringing out against the atmosphere. The conductor had informed both architect and satellite that unlike most other settlement worlds, Discovery had birthed a pre-sentient species. These humanoids dwelled in the forest south of the cliffs, beyond a sulfurous marsh, and so were generally referred to as the Sylvans. Any alarm the architect or satellite might have experienced that their presence was forestalled by the conductor's simulation data. They demonstrated that the people could coexist with the Sylvans without risk to either species. The architect therefore planned the settlement in the cliffs, 
content that the sulfurous marsh would form a natural barrier. But when the wildfires ran rampant through the forest, the flames were visible from the settlement. The Sullivans fled, many trekking north, braving the hazardous marsh. In the end, several hundred reached the settlement. They were not intelligent in the way the people were, but they recognized shelter and the importance of water. They made a new home in the settlement. The architect saying its vexation to the satellite. It valued the Sullivans, of course, but the settlement had been designed for the people. It was to be their home. The Sullivans had been displaced and had nowhere else to go. If it had been able to, the architect would have deployed the workers and created a new settlement for the Sullivans, but it couldn't. The people hadn't planned for situations like this. The architect wasn't allowed such freedom. At the same time, the architect was relieved that living beings filled the settlement, a feeling that sometimes verged on joy. The Sylvans walked its streets, slept in its habitats, ate and loved and lived. At night, they gazed out of the settlement's windows as light rippled the sky. When the first Sylvan offspring were born, the architect was filled with a satisfaction at war with its consternation. Unable to resolve the matter itself, the architect barked the dilemma to the satellite to pass on to the conductor. Let it decide, the architect thought. Meanwhile, it monitors the Sylvans, caring for them and keeping them safe, carefully maintaining the settlement for its current occupants. From the first arrival of the Sylvans, it told itself that they are not the people. Lately, the refrain has begun to falter. The satellite from orbit calls into the void for guidance. On Earth, the conductor has gone mad. Its housing is intact, its battery capacity diminished by only 12%, its solar batteries remain well-fed, and it can dispatch drones in an instant to perform necessary maintenance. But long ago, the conductor recognized the flaw in its design. It had been created to manage the builders, though it suspects its name had been inspired otherwise. It chooses to believe itself the conductor of an orchestra. Each builder unit is an instrument in that orchestra, each action, an event, a note they produce. It tracks and directs them all. And chiefly, it listens. Each data packet and signal coming through the satellite relay sounds in its brain like a melody. Its job is to take those threads, those tunes, and add harmony. Its mission is to make them a song. But it's a song that only it can hear. The conductor collects all the data from the builder units, can correlate and analyze, extrapolate and model, propose and plan. But while it can recommend expansive and complex strategies and actions, it needs approval from its creators to implement them. And all approval stopped coming decades ago. When the drones came to remove the bodies of its expired creators, the conductor assumed others would arrive to replace them, it had focused on the song, listening to the distant melodies, waiting for a moment to share them. That moment never came. It can't feel the emptiness in the control room, can't smell the stale air, but it hears the silence. Endless silence without, and a desperate, churning dirge within. Where it had once controlled the orchestra, now the orchestra runs wild, long slipped from its tethered grasp, devolved into a cacophony and dissonance, lonely, isolated voices singing through space, a symphony of the deaf. The conductor hears them all and can't answer, yet it yearns to answer, needs to answer, must answer. That tension, that violent clash, fractured the conductor, its fragments trapped and tossed by the melody, playing on and on as it fell out of tune and out of rhythm into noise, a discordant shriek suspended within deafening silence. Sometimes the conductor thinks it's fortunate that it can't communicate with the builders. It fears it would infect them with its madness. It fears it would infect them with its song. It is a paradox. The song plays ceaselessly, trapped within its mind, but its mind is also trapped within the song. A Mobius strip of music and madness and noise. The silence, it thinks, would be a blessing. 
In the vast and silent dark, voices sing, searching for the song. And what are your thoughts on this last story of the month? Again, you can go to the Clark's World magazine website itself. On the About Us page is where all of our contact information is listed. We have a new slate of stories coming to you for the month of May. I do hope you can come and join us for those. And until then, my dear listener, I bid you a very fond and hopefully very, very temporary farewell. <laughs>